Okay, even though tonight we're going to be talking about uh, prison epistles, I'd like to start with 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, just to, to make a couple touch points, particularly since uh, as to why we're talking about the New Testament. Why, why this particular collection of books and no other? And the bottom line is we are a people of the book, not a book. Uh, it's just not one of book of many, not, not just one library of many, uh, but it is, it is God's revelation. And particularly if you read uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, uh, in the context here of uh, Paul uh, talking to his spiritual son, it says, all scripture is God-breathed. And it's important that, to understand that this book is, is not just black and white paper and ink, uh, but there is something particular, something special about these writings in that they are life-giving. And the reason why they are life-giving spiritually is because God breathed them. The source is God, and the end product is what you have in front of you. Um, so it is God's word and will in black and white. It is not some sort of conjecture. Somebody didn't sit underneath a pie, you know, a palm tree sucking lemon drops and just sort of sat down and started writing some good thoughts and ideas. No, the Holy Spirit bore along, he breathed, he moved upon these men uh, to write God's word and will in black and white. And they're beneficial, it goes on to say. And it is useful for a number of things, for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. It's just not to tell us what is right, but to help us to correct what isn't. It is God's standard. It's not my best will. It's not what I think is right. It's what God thinks is right. And the ultimate goal is uh, here to, uh, so that the man of God and woman, men and women of God, brothers and sisters, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work the purpose of this book isn't just to occupy space and sit on your um, bedstand and collect dust. It isn't just to press flowers. It is to change lives, but also to equip you as a disciple so you can disciple others. So that you be able to be more effectual for the purposes of the gospel. So that you can be the feet and hands of Jesus literally. Okay, so that's a little introduction as to why we're going through this to uh, talk about the New Testament is because it makes a difference. It makes a difference, particularly in the day and nowadays in the climate that there's so many preachers that don't want to talk and say the Bible says or scripture says. Why? Because that might offend somebody. Uh, that seems kind of arrogant, doesn't it, that you have the truth and nobody else has any truth? Well, I'm sorry, that, that's part of the identity of the Christianity, is we, we have the truth. Jesus came, died, and, and lived in the flesh, and died on the cross, uh, not just because it's a nice idea, but because that's the truth. Anyway, person epistles. <laughs> and all the people said, amen. Push the right button, Rick. All right, person epistles. A little introduction. And just uh, some interactive ideas. Here is Paul, uh, uh, a sculptor, uh, sculpting in wax as to uh, his rendition of Paul. He got the, some of the ideas from um, some early writings. Some particular thoughts about correspondence, uh, letters. Most of us uh, receive letters in the mail, or even nowadays, better yet, email. Uh, old school, new school. And correspondence has to do with just communicating to a friend or somebody you know um, and to relate or communicate information or to extend and to develop relationships. You have there sort of an introduction. Generally speaking, many of these writers of the New Testament are eyewitnesses to the life, ministry, and teaching of Jesus uh, with the uh, probable exception of Paul. Uh, as far as being an eyewitness, who is an apostle born out of turn. These are letters, correspondence, 
written with a self-awareness that their words are directive and carry authoritative weight for the Christian community being God's word or divine insight into the moment or a present difficulty. It's, again, it's, they, they know they're writing purposefully. They know they are communicating authoritatively. Now, I've even read some commentators that, ah, no, this is just their best rendition, and they, do, they didn't really take themselves seriously. I'm sorry, you must be reading the different books than I do, because they say, basically, thus say the Lord, and then occasionally, like Paul, well, this is my opinion. So they make a difference. They, they make a distinction between this is my opinion and this is really what God wants to communicate. These letters are pretty straightforward with the reader, for the most part, not needing to be cautious if it is historical narrative, which we talked about a couple weeks ago, um, or direct application, or uh, uh, ap uh, apocalyptic literature for symbolic language, which we'll talk about next week. They are, these writings, are the interpretation and explanation to the life, ministry, and teachings of Jesus to real-life situations and for doctrine, faith, and practice. They're purposeful. They're to tell us how to believe and what to do in certain situations. Not just principles, but directives. Okay? Amen. I love these little clickies. Paul's and chains. So we're talking about tonight, at least introducing uh, the prison epistles which has to do with Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. Four books. So to sort of give a running start as to, well, why are we talking about the prison epistles? Why, why do we have a, care, uh, a, a category concerning prison? Uh, because this is where we're going to find Paul. And to sort of update us, you know, to fast forward through his life to get to this particular point, uh, Paul uh, has a ministry of about 30 to 35 years. And here in the prison epistles is near the end of his ministry. So how do we get there? Okay, here he, we find him in Rome writing these particular letters. Well, um, we find at least uh, our understanding of Paul when he wa is watching the, the coats uh, of the Sanhedrin at St uh, Stephen Stoning in Acts chapter uh, 7. And we find Paul, he's about 30 year, 33, 30, 30, 33 years old about that time. That's when uh, he begins minister, uh, ministry as far as within the Jewish community. Um, he has his mentor, who is Gamaliel, his advisor and mentor. But he perceives that his uh, mentor is kind of soft. It's kind of interesting, Gamaliel is um, a uh, one of the more conservative uh, theologians of his time, Jewish theologians. But uh, Paul thinks he's not conservative enough. That Paul felt justified in persecuting this, this new movement, the Christians. Uh, and he felt justified in thinking he's defending the faith. So to round up Christians and take property away from them, put them in prison, and in some instances even take their lives, he felt that he was justified. He was a bean counter. He was a, you know, nitpicky. This, is, this had to be done. Somebody had to step up and do this to defend the faith. And that was Paul before his conversion. He felt justified in persecuting Christians. Uh, Paul, uh, Saul, Saul gained a permit from the high priest to persecute, to, to extend his persecution, uh, not for, just for Jerusalem, but let's go on up to uh, uh, Damascus. And there, as he's on the road to Damascus, Jesus, he has a, G, a Jesus moment. <laughs> uh, he has a Jesus encounter, and Jesus basically knocks him for a loop, knocks him off his, uh, his ride, his, his donkey, and uh, uh, Paul can't see. Paul's about 34 years old at that particular time. Um, uh, he's blind, led, is led into Damascus, and Ananias, can you imagine... Uh, a dear Christian who this is, is praying before the Lord, and the Lord tells him, well, I want you to go visit Paul. No, I, I've heard rumors about Paul. He, he persecutes and he kills Christians. No, I want you to go. I want you to go and, and talk with Paul. No, you know, I, I, I treasure my life a little bit here, Lord. Uh, 
ask me to go to Africa or any other place. I'm just kidding. Um, but no, 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 send me to Saul. To, to Saul. So he was obedient and goes to Saul. And he, he lays hands on Saul and not only restores Saul's sight, but uh, prophesies over, over Saul as to his call, his mission in life to uh, represent Christianity uh, before uh, uh, kings and princes and, and nobles. Uh, so that was, that's the trajectory of uh, Paul's, or Saul's call at that particular time. Um, so he uh, uh, ministers at, uh, at Damascus for a period of time, and because of his education, a very well-educated man, probably in our day he would be a Ph.D., uh, very educated, multi multilingual, uh, very much of a scholar. And because of his background, because of his orientation of taking things into his own hands, you know, the Jesus encounter just flipped his whole theology, his whole purpose in life on its ear. So he goes from Damascus, and he goes out in the desert in Arabia for about three years to contemplate, to rethink things, study scripture. So you have an additional three years. So you're looking at, uh, at uh, Paul being about um, 36 or, or more years old. He eventually finds himself back to Jerusalem, begins to preach in the, uh, in the synagogues there, but it becomes too controversial. And that's what Paul is from the get-go. All his life, he's too controversial. He upsets the apple carts. He upsets the norm. His thinking is just uh, out of the park. And so the apostles take him aside uh, and they say, well, you know, uh, we need to sort of regroup here and uh, why don't you go back to Tarsus for a little bit and we'll call you when things settle down. So he goes, goes back home because he's Saul the butcher of Tarsus, right? So you know how many years he was in Tarsus waiting for the, the leaders of the church to bring him up and to be on the front lines again? Eight or nine years. Can you imagine waiting? Where, you know, where's that call? Where's that message? Where's, I've got a call in my life. God's shown me great things. You know, I've studied to show myself approved. God's called me. Jesus met me on the road. And yet, eight or nine years of silence. It wasn't until Barnabas, after there's a, a movement of God and uh, people of uh, uh, Syria, Syria, Antioch, uh, become Christians that are Gentiles, that Barnabas, who happens to know a little bit about uh, Saul, happens to remember about him. You know what? I know about this guy who's, who has a calling to minister to Gentiles. I think I'll go find him. And uh, I'll take him with me because the uh, apostles send uh, Barnabas to go check up what's happening up, of, up at Antioch. And he swings by, a little bit out of his way, to go, <laughs> go find a, a Saul. And he takes him to Antioch. And there they minister for a couple years. And it's there that Barnabas and, uh, and Saul are separated by the leadership of Antioch to become missionaries. And since Barnabas is the leader of the, of the gang, he decides, well, I want to go home to Cyprus. That's where he's from. And so let's go home and uh, we'll minister to people that we know. And uh, you have to start someplace. So it takes along John Mark. So the three of them and their entourage go to Cyprus. And while they're in Cyprus, uh, Paul, Saul, who is sort of sitting in the back seat, being submissive. Why? Because Barnabas was kind enough to, to call him forward. He, he learned his lesson not to be the controversial one, sort of sitting in the back seat, maybe even in the trunk, you know, as they're jottling down the road. He's quiet. He's letting Barnabas and everybody else speak and to minister and to be the front people. But while you get to a certain point in, in the visits of, of Cyprus, that Paul become, or Saul becomes Paul, and he becomes the front man. And since Paul 
becomes the front man, he begins to uh, minister, and they end up, end up going into the inner part of modern-day Turkey. And it's there that uh, they begin to establish churches that are outside of family relationships. They're outside of connections that anybody else knew. They were tilling uh, ground that nobody else had visited before. Fast forward, uh, we have, uh, after the uh, first missionary journey, uh, Paul is one of those controversial people. So the, the gospel he's preaching and what it means to uh, be a Christian to Gentiles um, sort of stirs up the church. And so they have a council at about 49 A.D. And Paul's about 52 years old. Uh, and the difficulty is, there's a, con a conflict as to, Paul says, Gentiles do not need to become Jews to become Christians. Don't need to be circumcised or any of the ritual cleansing pre uh, process and purity. Whereas the Judaizers, God's grace uh, uh, is dependent on legalistic ritualism, meritorious righteousness. I, I have to earn or have to do certain tasks to qualify. I have to become a Jew to become a Christian. And that's the contradiction. That's the conflict. And so Paul and Silas end up going on a second missionary journey uh, because Paul and Barnabas end up having a little uh, disagreement about John Mark. And uh, they have an argument, very much of a bitter argument, which they didn't reconcile. We have no record they ever reconciled. Okay. Fast forward, we have uh, Paul going through the, the second and third missionary journeys, establishing churches, not only in modern day, from what's referred to modern day Turkey, but uh, Greece, etc. Uh, and he ends up going back home. He's arrested in the temple, and uh, he's uh, carted off to Caesarea, which is along the coast, and is imprisoned for a couple of years there, waiting to have judgment, pass judgment, what to do with Paul, what to do with Paul, what to do with Paul. And he gets to talk to King Agrippa and uh, uh, Felix and Festus and a number of other uh, officials. Uh, and in process, he appeals to seeing Caesar because Paul is a Roman citizen. He didn't pay for that. He was born a Roman citizen, which is really rare uh, for, for a, a Jewish person. So he's shipped off to Rome. And he's waiting for a hearing before Caesar. He's, he's in this process of about three to four years waiting for uh, Caesar to be heard by Caesar. At first, it seems that he's under, under house arrest. He has his own apartment or house, so he has access to people coming and going, etc. Whereas later, it seems that he's actually uh, in prison. Uh, not the kind of prisons we have, uh, where you have three squares and, and uh, internet and uh, weightlifting machines, etc., um, no, it is uh, underground, uh, dripping walls, no restroom facilities, and probably not even fed unless somebody comes and brings food to you. So that's where we find Paul. Some background on uh, uh, Ephesus is our first book. Ephesus is, get my little laser here, and I love this little, see here you have Ephesus, it's on the coast of uh, modern day Turkey, and this particular location is really important because it is uh, uh, a location uh, uh, for trade, not only for the sea, but also by land, and uh, we also find here from Revelation the first couple chapters of Revelation, that this particular city is important because it influences all these others. It's like the, the mother church to all these other churches. So this, when you, this was established as an outreach to all the other regions here. So by writing this particular location, you're also administ uh, administ uh, <laughs> giving ministry to all these others, these other six churches. Okay, so that's the importance of Ephesus. And that's the way it was in quite a bit of church history, even to the 600s. 
there was a, a church council, a couple church councils at Ephesus. And this is just another picture to give you a perspective of Ephesus in comparison to where, um, for Antioch, where he first started, or where Jerusalem is in Israel, um, and Derby and Lystra, or um, some of the other locations that Paul uh, established other churches, and Athens, and then Rome is where uh, Ephesus is being written from. So he's writing from here, and it's sent to here. Other one. So it's a hub of international routing. And this is sort of a, another picture showing the, um, the landscape, you might say. Here down at the bottom, it gives you a picture again that's on the coast of Turkey. Here you can see the main uh, trade route going through Colossae, which we'll talk about, Laodicea, coming up through here, up to uh, Miletus, but also up to uh, Ephesus. Ephesus is on the main road or track uh, to the north, going from the interior. So Ephesus is not only a uh, uh, trade versus, uh, concerning the sea, uh, but also via, via the land. It was sort of a, a harbor, a point of, of interest internationally. Being international... We have, if you read uh, uh, in uh, Acts as to what the events are, uh, there's quite a, um, quite a stir as to the gospel. The gospel is impacting. Uh, Ephesus is about the size of Fort Wayne, about two, was, was about the size of Fort Wayne, about 250,000. Um, but when the gospel is introduced, if you can read uh, Acts, you have the opportunity to read the, the account in Acts, that lives were changed. The whole economy was impacted concerning the gospel. Not only uh, uh, as far as uh, the black arts, uh, you had Christians voluntarily stack up all their material and their books and scrolls and whatever and publicly burn them in front of everybody. This, we, no, we no longer practice this. We condemn this. And they put their livelihood to the torch. And then you have the Temple of Diana, where you have a whole uh, undergird structure concerning building uh, little idols of silver. A large segment of the number of uh, the economy concerning Ephesus. Uh, so Di uh, Diana, or Artemis, was the god. They had a temple there, which we'll have a picture of. This is the Greek version of uh, Diana, or Artemis. And this is her on the left-hand side. She's the hunter. And here's her hounds to go hunting, and there's her uh, bow, etc. cetera. Uh, she's a great hunter, a woman hunter. And so that's the Greek version. And here is the uh, uh, Ephesian interpretation of Artemis. A little bit different, isn't it? Personally, I think there's alcohol in, sort of involved in this particular interpretation, but... Um, Sort of the Cardassian version of that. I, I don't know. But that's, you still have the hounds. See, here's the remnants of the hounds here down here helping her to hunt. But what is she hunting? I, I don't know. But that's, that's what they were all up in arms and, and, pra and praising and screaming and yelling for two or three hours. <laughs> you know. Diana, Diana, Artemis, Artemis, you know, trying to praise uh, their goddess. And why? Because she had a temple there, one of the wonders of the world. This temple was ten times um, the expanse uh, and girth as what we find uh, in, uh, in Athens, um, the Parthenon. Ten times that. And what's left today? That. That. Probably because there was a couple earthquakes, sort of leveled things out, et cetera. Uh, the theater, the place that uh, they congregated uh, in Acts to um, to try and uh, uh, conflict with the gospel and throw Christians out of, of Ephesus, it actually exists today. You can go visit it. This is the very theater that they had a riot at, that you can read in Acts. 
and there's a library and the streets, you know, so here's a, a Roman road. You can imagine our roads lasting thousands of years uh, without road repair. Well, that's a Roman road right there. Anyway, just to give you a little insight as to that this is a real place with real people who had real lives, and that the gospel impacted not just the spiritual lives of people, but impacted them, the whole economy uh, of Ephesus. So turn the place upside down. Um, some particular themes. Uh, the first three chapters of this particular book uh, expresses what it means to live as if believers are already seated in the heavenlies. So definitely some good theologies to the, the benefits and privileges that we have as Christians. That we, ought, we have those benefits even now as we sit at these tables. The last three chapters unfold the practical examples of what it looks like to live in unity with the Holy God and with others. Uh, I, uh, the last uh, part of uh, uh, chapter 5 and into chapter 6, you have what's called the household regulations as to the home life. The how, should the, how should we conduct ourselves in, in relationships, husband to wife, wife to husband, uh, children to, to mother, children to father, etc. And the father should not exasperate their children. So those are commands. You know, how we should conduct ourselves, uh, not just as, as a good idea, but to our, our best ability, uh, even though imperfect, um, as to what those, uh, acknowledging what those standards are. So the, bo the book even closes with a master plan of spiritual warfare. So the whole book is like a legacy letter. It's one of the few letters that Paul has uh, wrote that um, doesn't have uh, as its purpose a problem, a difficulty. Um, so Paul's writing um, this particular church and the implications of those other six churches as to this is just not just good Christian ethics, but a good solid uh, uh, theology this way, how we, how we have a good understanding of who we are in Christ, our identity in Christ this way, and how that should meet itself out horizontally. Um, or better yet, um, what and how we believe should or ought to be reflected in how you act, conduct yourself, or how you treat others. It's one thing to have right belief, and you can write out the answers to all the right questions, be able to quote particular verses, etc. But if it doesn't work out, if it does, if you do, your how you treat each other, how uh, you conduct yourself in business or how your family life is run, if, they, if that's not affected, then, then this is kind of for naught, isn't it? It, it calls, calls into question as to what, what kind of relationship, how, how in-depth this relationship is. So that's the bottom line as far as uh, the book of Ephesus. Philippians. Philippians, written about 62 A.D., is Paul's in prison, which we already talked about. And I think Philippians is probably a little later in this particular um, timeline as far as previously he was under house arrest, whereas in Philippians he expresses an angst. Um, in other words, um, um, uh, he's emotionally challenged. He's under duress. Um, if you go open uh, Philippians chapter 1. Starting in uh, the last part of 18. And because of this I rejoice. Yes, I will continue to rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out to, to my deliverance. 
I eagerly expect and hope that I will be in no way be ashamed. In other words, he's being challenged, and he's kind of wondering if he's going to break down, uh, either break down while he's in prison or break down in front of Caesar. Uh, and the word ashamed is, is kind, of, kind of strong, an emotional expression. But will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or, or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I really don't know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain, and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. So here we have Paul a little bit under duress. Uh, he's conflicted as to the benefits. Uh, he doesn't know if he's going to be alive tomorrow. Uh, he doesn't know when his appointment is. He, he's, he's in a, in a prison prison. Uh, not, doesn't have too many um, um, comforts. And that's where we find him in the prison. And it's interesting that, that, that this book is a book no, noted for joy. Ministering and teaching us what joy and rejoicing is all about. Now just wait a minute. Let's, let's contemplate this a little bit. Where is Paul? Is he in a comfortable situation? So how is it that he's talking about joy? How is he teaching and ministering to others about joy when he's not in a joyful situation? He's under duress. And yet, he's talking to brothers and sisters hundreds of miles away about what it means to be joyful and how they should be joyful and that he wants to fulfill their joy. But it's more joyful for him to go to heaven, but he's going to stick around a little more and suffer so they can experience more joy. So in this particular book, you have this tension between suffering and and joy. I don't know about you, but when I suffer, it usually evaporates my joy. It usually extingu extinguishes my joy. I had the opportunity, I, I'm a, a cancer survivor, and there was a point in my life of grappling with what that means, and especially as a Christian, why me, Lord, <laughs> as, a, as a younger man and grappling with those hard questions and, and decisions. And I did not have joy. But in studying and teaching this particular book, it just so happens that it was in the middle of a, a period that I was teaching this book in, in a Sunday school class, and it just um, cut me to the core in realizing Paul's situation, and I was complaining, and he wasn't. So I learned about joy, joy in hardship, and that really, because uh, joy is a fruit of the Spirit, and fruit of the Spirit manifests itself in trials, in challenges. So when you talk about <laughs> Uh, Lord, give me, give me more long-suffering. <laughs> give me more long-suffering concerning my children. You know what's going to happen? You're going to be challenged <laughs> on your patience and endurance concerning your children. Long, long suffering. Why? Because it's in instances like that that the fruit of the Spirit flows and develops. Why? Because we get to a point where 
I realize I, I, it's beyond me. I, I can't do this. Uh, my long suffering is short. <laughs> I get angry with them. Lord, strike them. The Lord puts us in situations of long, a longer fuse. It's, it's right. It's beyond us. And so I had to learn what joy was. In the midst of my calamity, and it's not a fake joy. It's a joy that flows from within. In the middle of the circumstance, all of a sudden you realize joy. And joy is not happiness, by the way. <laughs> happiness is usually a response to an external circumstance. Uh, sort of like the commercial used to be uh, of guys sitting out on the back porch, you know, popping a couple of Miller lights. Man, it didn't get any better than this. That's happiness. You know, a, external response. Or you go and have a couple rides at the Seven Flags or something. That's happiness. But joy flows from within. That in spite of circumstances that you're in the middle of, you can experience joy. Because it bubbles up with the Holy Spirit empowering you from within, in spite or in the middle of your circumstance. Same with peace. Same with peace. You can have a hellish experience right now. And some of you have come from home, so maybe you don't look forward to going back home. And you don't have peace at home. Well, I hear you tell, I'm here to tell you that you can experience that peace right in the midst of the trials. You may not know even what tomorrow holds, but you can experience that peace. And that's Philippians. It's interesting that this particular letter was written about 10 years after uh, Paul and Silas established the church of Philippi. It's kind of interesting that this particular letter is one of Paul's most personable letters. He shares his heart. He shares his vulnerability with uh, people that he only knew briefly. He didn't spend much time in Philippi. Um, but yet he has an intimate relationship with them. And even the vocabulary in, in chapter 1, it's, he appeals to them just as if they're sitting in the cell right beside him. That they are co-workers with him. They're co-laborers with him. They are suffering with him right where he is. And it's the vocabulary that he uses as he's expressing his, his relationship with them. So the purpose written, to update them on his whereabouts because they've lost track of him. He's no longer in a, uh, in a rented house, uh, but expresses his heart to them in a vulnerable manner and expresses his thankfulness for sending material aid to Epaphroditus. Colossians. Colossians is sort of a, a sister letter of Ephesians. It has some very similar content as to, it'd be nice to have a little clicker, Rick, if we go on to Colossians. That was a theater, by the way, that they took Paul and uh, Silas to and had a riot. There's some uh, excavations of Philippi. But we're on to Colossae. Colossae is just down the road from Ephesus. Here's Colossian, Colossae. And there's Laodicea. Here's Ephesus. Uh, it's interesting that uh, Ephesus is not over, as far as influence, over Colossae. So in writing Colossae, it is outside of the realm of influence of Ephesus. Just a point of interest. But it's on the same trade route. Um, this particular book uh, not only is a sister letter of Ephesus, but also conveys some good solid theology as to uh, interacting with, with Gnosticism, which is a, a philosophy that a actually existed before Christianity. And there's several schools uh, of thinking within uh, Gnosticism. 
uh, one which John interacts with, which denies the physical, um, that you're really, you're really spiritual if you deny your body. Um, but Colossians has a certain segment, uh, starting in chapter 1, verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And that's the preeminent one. He's not the first created. Why not, Rick? Because it goes on and talks about that. How can you create yourself? For by him and through thing, read Rick. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. So if he's created, he'd have to create himself. And I say that because this is a famous particular passage that the Jehovah's Witnesses like to appeal to. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He's the super glue of the universe. Jesus is. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. And again, not, not just the first to raise again from the dead, uh, but he is the preeminent one. He, he's the reason why we are all going to raise again from the dead bodily. Uh, anyway, this goes on to explain and interact with Gnosticism as to um, good solid theology as to who Jesus is. And it's, it's, um, <laughs> uh, it's, it's demands that this is who Jesus is, not, not uh, Gnosticism. Philemon. Philemon is a particular individual. He is probably, if not the pastor, he is, it's his home that uh, the small group or the church is uh, having meetings at. Uh, they're in Colossae. Um, that is where they're located at. Um, it just so happens that Onesimus, uh, who is, ends up being a, a slave uh, to Philemon, uh, runs away and probably takes uh, a number of items, food, goods, or otherwise, uh, to escape with him, which basically he's stealing from Philemon. So somehow Onesimus finds his way to Paul. Um, I don't know, it's because uh, they both know each other, Philemon and Onesimus. Obviously, I think Philemon does. Uh, but Paul writes on behalf of Onesimus uh, as to uh, holding Philemon accountable. And this is the perfect example of grace and forgiveness. And it's one of the few times that Paul basically says to Philemon, uh, you received Christ because of my ministry. And in the same grace, I'm asking you to extend that same grace to Onesimus. And you know what? Bottom line, you owe me. You owe me. Your spiritual life and what you're experiencing now, the benefits, um, you owe me. And if there's anything Onesimus think, that you think Onesimus owes you, put it on my account. And so it's a figurative way of expressing, um, just like you and I, I owe a lot to Jesus because he died on the cross for our sins, that ultimately, as good disciples, our motivation is to live on behalf of him. Yes, ma'am. Precisely. But in Philippians, you also have, uh, well, gosh, in Galatians, which we'll get to, is you also have to work it out. Not work for it, you work it out. So it's just not an initiation of, of becoming saved this way, it's working it out. Same with James. We'll get into James. James talks about that well, you can express faith, even the de demons believe, um, but that's, that's not the end. It's working it out. It's, it's living it out. It's not owning. Owing. owing. We owe Christ. Our lives. He, he, our lives are not our own. They're bought. We can talk after class, okay? Okay. As to some good uh, dialogue concerning good theology. So that's Philemon. So... Um, at this particular point, um, 
we can have uh, everybody sort of stand up for a little bit as we transition over to uh, James. A uh, runaway slave. Onesimus is a runaway slave. Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to session three. We've got tonight and then next week, and we wrap up. So uh, I want to encourage those of you that missed last week because of the inclement weather. Um, I do have the fill-ins for the blanks. If you need that, we can s just see me after class. Also, as Vicki mentioned at the beginning of class, there is, um, you can go online. And I feel a little bit in trouble because Yvonne said she watched week one, and I'm like, oh, boy. Don't watch week two. So Yvonne, if you're listening, don't, let, don't watch week, uh, of course that's inviting her, right? She's gonna be watching that. I do have some good news. Uh, you know, we gave away a book the first two weeks and uh, I talked to my good friend uh, Orpa Winfred and everybody gets a free car tonight. So, <laughs> so just be looking for it somewhere in the parking lot around here. Of course, you do got to pay the uh, excise tax and sales tax, and I think the folks on uh, her show were pretty upset that that wasn't really free. <laughs> uh, however, when my uh, nephew took a picture of her, his uh, second child and submitted it to Gerber, uh, actually his daughter won the baby of the year two or three years ago. And uh, with that came a $50,000 um, bond or gift for uh, little Isla's education. And they paid extra for taxes. I thought that was really good. <laughs> so instead of your, here's your 50,000 minus 14,000 taxes, they actually paid extra. And of course they got all kind of baby food. And so my nephew went on a baby food diet. No, I'm just kidding. But. Uh, <laughs> But uh, anyway, that was pretty cool. So our, our, our family had a little uh, uh, 15 minutes of fame, uh, having little Isla being the uh, Gerber baby of the year. I don't know if you're familiar with that. I guess around 100 to 200,000 photos are submitted, and somehow Isla won. So a little 15 minutes of fame. And as someone once said, uh, and they even had a button, says your 15 minutes are up, you know? <laughs> So that's too true, isn't it? People get on the spotlight, they become really famous. Okay, let's take those guys off there. All right, turn to page 24 in your notes, and we're going to pick up with the uh, pastoral epistles. And uh, that is the books of First and Second Timothy and Titus. So this is where uh, Paul writes um, uh, both Timothy, two letters, and Titus. Before we go any further, I want to inquire, did anybody do the justification study? Okay, I'm going to issue the challenge again, back on page, uh, where was that? Page 21. Uh, take, check that out, put a little note there, and just say, Jim, really recommend you do this. So, uh, uh, I really encourage you to do that justification study. If you have any questions on if the instructions aren't clear, um, feel free to uh, contact me or see me, hunt me down, okay? All right, so the young pastors, uh, Timothy and Titus, after f Paul's first Roman imprisonment, they give practical instructions on the care for the churches where they happen to be. What's interesting, and your notes say this, 
that the pastorals, these three books, give historical and geographical data or information that is not found anywhere else in the New Testament. So it's really fascinating. So when you read through the, as we mentioned when I covered Acts, uh, Timothy and Titus give data there that lends some information that is not there. For example, in Titus 1.5, we have the island of Crete. Uh, Rick mentioned about the island of Cyprus and uh, with Barnabas as, as, at his home, but also Crete there, just south of the mainland of Greece. That's mentioned for the first time. Also, uh, that he traveled to Ephesus with Timothy and hopes to return. Uh, he intends to winter in Nicopolis. I think I got a map here. Here we go. Uh, and so Nicopolis is this island in, uh, not, excuse me, city in western Greece. Here's Crete down here. And uh, Paul's writing, uh, saying, hey, uh, meet me up over here uh, by winter. And then we also see, uh, from, especially from the, uh, the book of uh, 2 Timothy, that he is in prison and he's expecting to die. So I've written here, uh, that really there's strong evidence from the information that he went to Crete, he's sending Timothy back to Ephesus, and uh, then he's meeting up in Nicopolis, and uh, that this indicates that there's some kind of a, an additional journey that Paul went on. We don't know 100%, but it's by deduction. And so uh, the, these, these books kind of reveal that there's probably, Paul has a, a fourth missionary journey. So the book of Acts has uh, described three of them, and Titus and Timothy kind of hint that there is actually a fourth journey. All right, let's talk about Timothy. That's your blank there. Next. Uh, he's mentioned for the first time in Acts chapter 16 as a disciple from Lystra, which is in the region of Galatia. Uh, he's mentioned 25 times in the New Testament. Quite a bit, isn't it? His mother was Jewish. His father was a Gentile, which, uh, if I understand right, that he, was, he would be considered actually a Jew. Uh, and that is carried to this day, that if your mother is Jewish, you are considered uh, a Jew, if it's uh, a non uh, racial with the father, non-Jewish. The first mention takes place during the second missionary journey of Paul and indicates that he came to faith earlier, perhaps during fall, Paul's first missionary journey in the mid to late 40s in the region of Galatia. He calls him my true son in the faith, my dear son, and Timothy was brought up steeped in the scriptures with God, uh, godly family roots. How many come from a a godly family, uh, maybe parents or grandparents, maybe aunts or uncles. Isn't that a blessing? And uh, I really consider that a blessing in my life, that my parents uh, faithfully brought me to church. Uh, we were devout in our attendance, and when the Holy Spirit put the doors off my head, I got involved, and uh, it was wonderful. But also my uh, ancestors as well, on my mom's side especially, uh, and my dad's side, there's some stories but especially had some really great stories. My mom grew up with her grandmother and Grandmother Riddle, and she was all, my mom would always, when she'd hear a verse, she'd say, oh, that's one Grandma Riddle would always quote. And typically they were proverbs, like uh, he who can keep his anger is stronger than he who takes a city. I think that's Proverbs 15, 1 or somewhere around there. But uh, anyway, great, great uh, words to live by is the book of Proverbs, isn't it? Billy Graham uh, said while he was alive, every day he would read a chapter out of the Psalms to uh, relate closer to God and a chapter out of Proverbs to relate to people. And uh, that's good advice, isn't it? Uh, Proverbs is pretty cool because it's 31 chapters, and so you can pretty much, you know, today's the 19th, read chapter 19, and then by the 19th of next month be through the whole book. Not so the case on the Psalms, but, uh, but it's still good, good scripture. We also see uh, that he accompanies Paul in his missionary journeys, uh, church planting, pastoral efforts in Macedonia. And Macedonia is, uh, well, I don't have a map up. Let me see if I can go back here. Um, Macedonia is this area up here uh, north of the main part of Greece. And uh, as Rick mentioned about Philippi, there's, there's a location there in Greece. Consider traditionally when you cross the Helen spot here, this little body of water, which is just a little sliver here, that is considered 
from what continent to what continent? Anybody know? From what's over here on the right? Asia and Europe. Okay, so that's the traditional division between uh, those. But ethnically, this whole area was considered Greek uh, in that day. They all spoke Greek. Uh, they all had Greek culture, the Greek gods and goddesses and so forth. It wasn't until uh, centuries and centuries later that the Turks and other groups migrated in from the east. Over here, way over here, if you see that little, uh, little uh, <laughs> dot, they came way over here and migrated over and pushed people out, and so the Turks are there now, but still Greece here. And uh, that's where we are in, in today's world. Achaia and Ephesus, as well as Macedonia. That's also referenced in Acts. He's called a, uh, he's a steady companion in Romans. He's called a fellow worker. Uh, he was with Paul during his first Roman imprisonment. So when you start to read, as, as uh, Rick went through, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon, he's mentioned right in there. Timothy is also a co-sender in six of Paul's epistles. Corinthians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, try to say that, and Philemon. Timothy had been entrusted with the three previous assignments to the churches, to Thessalonica, to Corinth, and to Philippi, and Paul speaks very warmly of him in Philippians 2 and 1 Corinthians 4. So just reading that, you can see he was part and parcel with Paul's ministry, wasn't he? He wasn't just, you know, a convert, but he was, he was part of the team. And, and very close to him. Uh, 1 Timothy 4.12 is a great verse that I read when I was younger. It says, let no one be ashamed of your youth, but be an example for the believers. And so uh, we kind of deduce from that. If Paul's saying, hey, don't be, don't be ashamed uh, because of your youth, he could be referring to that maybe he was a little timid as a pastor or as a leader, because here he's writing it there in 1 Timothy 4 when Timothy was in Ephesus uh, at the church there, and Paul wasn't. It's also conjectured that after Paul's release from his first prison, uh, Roman imprisonment that, that uh, Rick was alluding to, that he traveled with Paul once again and stayed on at Ephesus to manage the problems occurring there. At the end of Paul's life, he requested him to join him at Rome. So somewhere in Paul's plan that we deduce from uh, Titus and Timothy, Paul planned to winter in Nicopolis, meet up with Titus, and then go on to other points. But he was rearrested. Doesn't say it, but that's the implication because he's back in Rome. And we have those great passages that we'll look at here where he's, he's uh, hinting that he's at the end of his life. Interesting, too, Hebrews 13 also mentions that Timothy himself was in prison, but he was released. So, uh, so not only Paul, but his teammates, his uh, ministry team, were also in prison for their faith. Uh, and Timothy probably outlived Paul. This is a, um, well, the picture that you have in your, on uh, page 24 there is uh, some artist there with, uh, talking about the laying on of hands uh, where they commissioned uh, people to preach the gospel and to minister. Uh, a great practice of prayer, isn't it? Next we have uh, Titus, and uh, this is actually a picture of uh, uh, in, in Crete, and that's not Titus with a splitting headache, by the way. Uh, but uh, that is a Roman, Roman statue. But this is the Basilica to Titus, which is still standing uh, today. It was built back in the, uh, uh, around the year 500 AD, so several centuries after Titus left the island of Crete, unless he had a really long ministry, okay? But uh, in, if you go... In, in, on Google Maps, and you go to this place in Gortnia, that's where the, the town is, that if you swivel around to the other side, it's all an open shell. An earthquake happened around, uh, around that time, and uh, just after they built it, and, and it shook things, and it messed things up, and so that basilica was moved. But look at the uh, interesting shape of the old churches, where they just had basically a dome, and uh, typically the Eastern Orthodox churches have the domed churches, and it wasn't really until the Middle Ages when the people in the West got that Gothic where they had those big vaulted uh, uh, ceilings and the arches and all that. How many have been to a cathedral before? Anybody? Pretty amazing, aren't they? Anybody been to Europe in cathedrals? 
Have you? Awesome. I'd love to go there. I've been to the Washington Cathedral in Washington, D.C. Uh, just amazing, isn't it? Those cathedrals, just uh, awe-inspiring, uh, really, uh, if you consider that, that uh, walk out of the fields as a peasant, and then you walk into this an unbelievable place that's still standing that you could see that, you know, it would be very uh, inspiring to your faith. Now for Titus, much less is known about him. Uh, the book of Acts doesn't even mention him at all. Uh, however, we do uh, read about him in the book of Galatians. He's a Gentile and he's uncircumcised. This is a particularly uh, 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 hot button because uh, as Rick mentioned, in the early church it was an issue whether you had to be a Jew to be a Christian. And, uh, and particularly the sign of being a Jew was the, the right of circumcision first established in Genesis 17. In Genesis 17, God told Abram, he says, you are to be circumcised, that's the sign of that you belong to me. And the cutting off of the flesh represents uh, that you belong to me. And also the cutting represents the sanction or the warning that you will be cut off from me if you disobey my, the, my covenant. So you'll see that word cut off um, uh, mentioned throughout the Old Testament and always harkens back to the uh, circumcision. In fact, in the uh, Hebrew, where it says that they made a covenant or, or agreement with God, the actual word there is they cut a covenant. How many of you like to, you know, <laughs> be involved in something like that? Okay, not much just on paper, but let's take, let's take knife and you know, actually cut your skin, and uh, that's to remind you to obey God. Okay, but um, when we get to the New Testament and the, and the wine of the gospel and the old wineskins, it bursts, right? It, it bursts the old system that you don't need to be a Jew to be a Christian. And, and so there was a showdown uh, with the early church and this Judaizing or legalistic element that was a part of the early church. And Paul felt vindicated because they did not require Titus to be circumcised. So he was kind of a case study. You know, he was a believer, he was a Gentile. Now, is the church leadership going to force him to be circumcised? And Paul says he wasn't. So that proves the, the point that you just have to believe in Jesus. That's the point. Um, Titus also delivered a difficult Pauline epistle to the Corinthians, which is mentioned in the book of 2 Corinthians. There are references there in your notes. He was an uh, instrument of delivery to the gifts of the poor, to Jerusalem. So when Paul went on his missionary journeys, he's not only preaching the gospel, but he also told then the new congregations, hey, now that you've received the spiritual blessing from the Jewish people on the Messiah, I want to give you opportunity to give back. And how many of you know that, uh, that if you have the right heart about giving, it should be joyful? It should come out not under compulsion, not under feeling guilt, not under the law, you have to give a certain percentage, but you want to give because you love the Lord. And Corinthians mentions, and I don't know if uh, Rick is going to bring this out when he covers Corinthians, but, uh, you know, God says we're to give hilariously. That's the word there. We're to give with great joy. And uh, you can't give with great joy if you're resentful. Oh, my gosh, you know, I, you know this, is, this is really a lot of money. Uh, but you give because you have joy. And that's what Paul said. Give to these uh, uh, brothers in Jerusalem who are, are, are going through a famine and they need your help. And so they, they were new believers. How many know new believers can get really excited about the faith? And they can do kind of crazy stuff like witnessing to everybody and also giving a lot. And that's what they did. And so Titus was the one who then uh, delivered uh, at least one of those uh, deliveries down to Jerusalem to give. And um, Paul quotes Jesus and uh, he says it's more blessed to give than to receive. Isn't that true? He quotes that in the book of Acts, chapter 20. It's not in the Gospels. That's kind of interesting. It is conjectured that after his release from prison in Rome in Acts 28, Titus evangelized the island of Crete with Paul and was assigned to stay there to set the churches in order. He was soon to be replaced by Artemis. This is on page 25 now. And was to join Paul in Nicopolis. So that was the, that was the plan. But as you know, as Proverbs says, uh, man has a plan, but it's the Lord's will that will be fulfilled. So Paul had his intentions, but it, it evidently didn't quite work out. It says in 2 Timothy 4 that Titus went on to Dalmatia. So back to our map, 
Dalmatia uh, is up the coast this way and uh, was part of the, the, the Roman province up here. And uh, so that's where Titus ended up uh, when Paul writes what's considered, 2 Timothy is considered Paul's last epistle. It's the very last one. He calls him his true son, and so that indicates he, uh, they were very close and possibly a conversion uh, under Paul's ministry. Okay, let's look at some of the themes uh, and phrases that are in the pastoral epistles. And a lot of them are written out there for you. Okay, so we have God the, Sa God the Savior. Quite a bit uh, of, of that is emphasized in uh, Timothy and Titus, and also Jesus as our Savior. Also another phrase that uh, sound doctrine and faith, uh, faith and teaching is also there. And the word sound, in other words, to keep it correct or orthodox, eight times in the pastoral epistles, and, but guess what? Whoops, nowhere else is it listed in Paul's writings. So that's kind of unique. So even at the end of Paul's ministry, he's dealing with people who are distorting the word of God, and he's saying we need to, we need to have sound teaching. Also, uh, the word godliness is in there, uh, and it's mentioned eight times in the pastoral epistles, all three books. Also, the word godliness, interestingly enough, is nowhere, that particular word, is listed in uh, any of other Paul's writings. So, he, again, he has an emphasis that we need to be godly. We need to have a godliness as an authentic, not just a religion to make money. He mentions that in, in uh, Titus and Timothy. Uh, uh, people that are going out there and, and uh, being hucksters for the gospel. Has that ever changed? We still have that today, don't we? Uh, in fact, there's, you know, even in uh, 100 years ago or several decades ago, remember the guy Elmer Gantry, and they made a movie on that, and that was to make fun of uh, traveling evangelists. And we have that on TV, and a TV evangelists, and people that are going out for money, and so forth and so on. Uh, that's as old as the New Testament. The word controversies is also mentioned. So there are uh, things going on within the churches at Crete, and also where Timothy is in Ephesus, that are bringing, it's bringing uh, a disruption within the church. And Paul is saying we need to deal with these controversies, and he's giving Timothy and Titus instruction on how to handle that. So uh, it's a manual on how to deal with false teaching. So uh, Titus and Timothy both are going to give you some good information when you study those books, how to handle teaching that comes across your path that you're hearing about, or maybe a relative. I knew a, a lady when I worked at Youth for Christ in their administrative office. She said, I have a cousin who's very intelligent, uh, and I think he, had a, uh, he was a professor of mathematics somewhere, but he got involved with a cult. And this cult uh, was or is still out in Montana, and they're digging at this big tunnel in there and storing up these big bunkers and stockpiling weapons and food. It's called the Church Universal and Triumphant. Anybody heard of that? And Rick has heard of that. And uh, I don't know if they're still around, so we'll have to ask Alexa about that. But uh, they, they were around for a while, and this lady, I think her name was, um, it might be Mother Ann. I can't, I, I, I might get her, that's actually the, the uh, shaker lady, Mother Ann. But some, some lady there, It'll hit me right in the middle of somewhere else what I'm talking about. But some lady was their leader. And uh, she uh, uh, gave these great prophecies. And it sucked in this woman's cousin who was very smart, but yet he got carried away with a controversy or uh, something that had not sound doctrine or sound faith. And so that's still around today. Paul talks about trustworthy sayings. He mentions that five times in the epistles. And there you go, again, your favorite word for this page is nowhere. It's nowhere else in Paul's epistles. So it's very unique. Paul uh, is addressing, uh, it could be that the reason that some of these uh, phrases and words were unique is because these are personal letters to pastors, to leaders, as opposed to churches in general. Uh, Paul, uh, Rick mentioned about Ephesus. That was probably a circular letter that, that went to one church, then they read it and they passed another. 
Uh, you'll note when you read the book of Colossians at the very end, he says, now, I wrote the Laodiceans, make sure you uh, read the letter I sent to them, and then you pass that one on to someone else that, that, I, that I gave you. Uh, the letter to Laodicea, we don't have a, an epistle called the, to the church at Laodicea that Paul wrote. Some may think it may be Ephesians, but we really don't know. So it's either lost to history, or it could be the book of Ephesians. We don't know. So it's interesting, you get little tidbits of clues. As someone once said, that when you read the uh, books that Paul wrote as epistles, 13 of them out of the 27 in the New Testament, all the books there, that it's like listening to someone on one side of a phone conversation. And, you know, you ever walk into a room and somebody's on the phone and you hear them talking? Oh, you don't say. Really? How did that happen? And you're like, oh, what happened? What, what happened? Oh, really? They went to the hospital? Oh, somebody got hurt. Somebody got hurt. You know? And then you find out later, no, they just visited the hospital for who someone they knew. So you don't know the whole story. And so you get these little personal references when you read the, the epistles. It doesn't change the message, but you kind of get this little, 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 uh, little tidbits of information about Timothy and Titus and also about different letters that were written and where Paul plans to travel. It's not earth-shaking, but it is interesting, and you try to piece together what, what happened in the chronology. That can help, help with its meaning uh, in a general sense, but theologically it really doesn't change a whole lot. Okay, so what's the occasion and, and the purpose with Timothy? So I gave you the reference there in the middle of page 25. Here, here I kind of excerpted it. Here's what Paul writes. He says to Timothy, stay in Ephesus, command certain men not to teach false doctrines. These promote controversies rather than God's work. Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to your care. Some have wandered from the faith. So what we see here is that Paul planted a church and there's stuff going on within the church that's splitting the church and drawing people off, wandering away from the faith, and he's putting his right-hand man there and saying, please stay there and teach them correct doctrine. So that's the bottom line on uh, the book of 1 Timothy. Titus, he says, I left you in Crete that you might straighten out what was left unfinished, and appoint elders in every town. And as soon as I send Artemis and Tychicus to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis. Okay, so again, uh, it, when he uses the word straighten things out, that tells you things are out of joint, right? And so again, Paul is saying, you know, hey, uh, you can be my right-hand man here and help. You know, Paul does mention, and I'll have to have, maybe get some help from Rick or someone, where Paul does say, I have the distress of all the churches on my heart. I think it's in Corinthians when he lists all the troubles he went through. Remember that? Like he's been shipwrecked. He's been chased out of town. He's had trouble in town and out of town and so forth. And he also mentions, plus, all the distress of all the churches that I planted. In other words, he cares for them. And he's a traveling guy. He's itinerant. And yet he loves the people that he brought to faith and he wants them to, to increase. Uh, and so... He's worried about him. And so here he is, uh, a strategy is, I can't go there, but I'm going to appoint men who can follow up. What's the occasion and purpose for the last uh, uh, pastoral epistle, 2 Timothy? He says, night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers, recalling your tears, I long to see you. Very, very personal, isn't it? I am ready to be poured out like a drink offering. So as a Jewish person, you know this uh, Jewish ritual where they would take the pitcher and then they would pour it out as part of a, uh, a, a, a symbolic of, of giving over to God. And uh, he uses that particular analogy to say, I'm going to die soon. Okay? The time has come for my departure. And he, he means death. And then we have these great words. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Those are inspiring, isn't it? You know, when we uh, stand before God, he's not going to say, man, what an impressive bank account. Or look at the wardrobe you got. Or hey, you paid off all your debts. Or, you know, all these things that we measure success by. What does is, what is Paul hint at by sharing his own life? I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race. What does that mean? I kept the faith. I kept the faith. I didn't, didn't desert the Lord when times got tough. When, when uh, Rick was talking about, you know, the long-suffering and the 
patience that we need. That's the bottom line where God looks at. And someone once said, you know, when we get to heaven, God's not going to say, why weren't you as great as Billy Graham? He's going to say, why weren't you who I created you to be? You know? And uh, that's, that's the key. Because we are each uniquely gifted, aren't we? We're each anointed to give uh, and serve the Lord. Okay, so there, there's the occasion and the purpose that, uh, that uh, Paul mentions on the um, pastoral epistles. I'd like to just look at a couple passages here. There's the outline, by the way, of Timothy at the end of page 25, extending to page 26. Then at the bottom of page 26, you have a general outline of 2 Timothy. And then uh, on the page 27, then you have the outline of the book of Titus. So if that helps you, you when you read those books, uh, you can literally read Titus. It's only three chapters. You can literally read it in about 10 minutes. Uh, just a personal tip, uh, I would recommend that you read it out loud uh, and have a pen in hand and uh, underline and, and uh, write things in the margin. Uh, your Bible, I believe, is meant to be used. Um, you know, there's the old story, it's a true story, that when the English left England, uh, many of the, the reformers left because Mary, remember Bloody Mary, the queen? She was persecuting Protestants. So they all ended up, uh, not all, but quite a few ended up in Geneva, Switzerland, and they wrote an English Bible called the Geneva Bible. This was the Bible the pilgrims took with them to America. It wasn't the King James, it was the Geneva Bible. It was very, very popular. And one thing that's interesting about the Geneva Bible is that it was what we would call today a study Bible. It had all kind of notes in it. Well, King James, when he came from Scotland to be king of England, he looked at that Geneva Bible and he, he was very sensitive about being king because he was divinely ordained to be king. That's what he felt. And there, and there were some notes in there that talked about how the monarchs are under, you know, need to be accountable and so forth. He didn't like the notes. He goes, no notes. We need a new version. And name it after me. <laughs> they didn't name it after him. Actually, it's called the authorized version, but uh, ended up being called the King James Version. And so if you look in your King James Bible, there are no notes. There's no footnotes. That's the way King James wanted it because he didn't want those rascally Protestants putting things down there on there and uh, influencing you by what these scholars thought. But uh, so today, if you, you can buy a Geneva Bible, or if you go online, you can get that version. You'll see quite a few footnotes. And of course, uh, I have the NIV Study Bible, and sometimes it takes up more page, the notes take up more page than the text does. You know, it's like, wow, this book is really long. Well, it's not long, there's too many notes to it, you know. But uh, that can be helpful. Don't want to rely on them, but it's helpful, uh, the scholars that uh, do that. Okay, so all that to say is that you can read through these books fairly quickly, and I encourage you to, to take notes. All right, so um, that's the end of my slides. But before I hand it back over to Rick, I'd like to read some passages. So let's go to uh, 1 Timothy. And let me just open it up. Does anybody have any favorite uh, verses in 1 Timothy? Any that you got memorized or... Or a favorite, favorite uh, Rick brought up one. Uh, uh, or that's 2 Timothy, is it? 2 Timothy 3.16, about uh, all God's word is uh, inspired. Anybody? Nobody? Nobody? Anybody read 1 Timothy? It's a good book, right? Okay. <laughs> all right. So look at verse one, uh, chapter 1, verse 12. This is interesting because Paul in Philippians chapter 3 says, Forgetting what is behind, I press forward, right? to run the race, and to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward. And it's interesting because 1 Timothy, uh, uh, Philippians 3, and also 1 Timothy 1, Paul gets autobiographical. He shares his past. So let's read this, and then let's talk about what does Paul really mean, forgetting what is behind and pressing what is forward. Look at verse 12. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me faithful, appointing me to a service. Now, look at the caveat, verse 13. Even though I was once a, what? Blasphemer. What in the Jewish religion is the penalty of blasphemy? Death, isn't it? And a persecutor. And, if you can't quite get the picture, a violent man. 
I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. Even though, as Rick correctly said, he thought he was serving God, but he was really ignorant and really uh, in unbelief. Kind of like that girl. <laughs> Did you read the news? This girl that, that, uh, from Alabama that became a, a part of ISIS when she was 19 and she went over to Syria. Guess what? She wants back home now. She said, this is all what I bargained for. I don't like this. Please, America, give me another chance. That's what this news article. Hopefully she can uh, get back and, and live a better life. But Paul acted in ignorance and unbelief. Verse 14, the grace of our Lord was what? Poured out. How much? Abundantly. Along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Paul is saying, I didn't deserve it. But God just swamped me with it. You ever see the Gatorade uh, when they douse those coaches when they win a game? It's kind of like that. Not when they miss the coach, but when they actually get the coach. And they douse them. And he's totally sopping wet. That's the same word that's used there. It's overflowing. It's abundant. Verse 15. Here's a trust trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came in the world to save what? Sinners. Wasn't that Jesus' big, big point when he talked to the religious people that thought they had it all together? He said, look, I didn't come to call you faith. I came to call what? Sinners. It's the sick who need a doctor, not those who are well. So don't get down on me because I'm touching and relating to, to sinful people. That's what I came here for. And Paul said the same thing. Of whom, where does he rank? The louder? He's the worst. Okay, that's quite, he's laid it out, isn't he? I, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example to those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. So he's saying, you know what? I was messed up. I got a past. I got, I, got a, I got some baggage. I got a history. But you know what? That only displays how great God is. And how many of you know a real church, a real church fellowship is where people are authentic with each other. We're real with each other. We hurt with each other. We realize we struggle with each other. We, 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 we are um, people who show the world what it's like to forgive each other and to love each other and to show each other grace. It's not that we got it all together. Look at our great building. Look at our, listen to our great slick songs that we sing. Look at how nice and smiley we are. No, you know, look at how we forgive each other when we hurt each other. You know, look at, the, look at where God has brought us from. And uh, that's, what, that's what the real church is about. I've heard the story where someone from AA, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, where, he, it, where they get really real with each other. I mean, they'll call each other out if they sense that another person is lying. And they're, they're a very tight-knit group, and they kind of keep each other accountable. That they've walked into a church, and they said, this is not real. These people are just playing religion. And the, he picked up on it right away. Paul is laying it right out there, isn't he? He's saying, I was a terrible person. I was a persecutor. I was violent. I was a blasphemer. In fact, someone, I don't have it in front of me, someone wrote a resume uh, of Paul, fictional, and listed all the stuff he did that he was applying to be a pastor at a church. And it was hilarious because you would say any governing board would look at that resume and say, holy moly, we're taking a nine-foot pole and staying away from that guy. But it was the Apostle Paul. And look at how mightily God used him. So it's not our past that binds us, but it's the grace of God that we've received, that, that we lived a transformed life. We're not perfect yet, but we're moving on. So I really believe that when Paul wrote in Philippians 3, forgetting what is behind and pressing forward, he wasn't saying, I've, I have brain amnesia and I, I've totally, uh, you know, have had a shock treatment and I don't remember anything in the past. No, he wrote about it. He laid it out there. But I think what he was saying is, I'm not letting my past control me. I'm free from my past because God has set me free. And the chains and the guilt and the, the remorse and the fear, whatever it is that we carry in from the past, we can be set free from that. Isn't that good news? We don't have to let shame or remorse 
or, or, or fear or whatever it is we have from our past be our present or our future. Because Jesus pours out his grace abundantly on us. And we're an example of God's grace and mercy. Praise God. And that's, 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 a, that's a life lesson. That, that's just somebody up there teaching. He lived it. And we can live it too. We can live victory. You don't have to let Satan uh, bring us down. Someone said, when Satan comes knocking at your door of your heart or your mind, reminding of you of your past, remind him of his future. Okay? Put in perspective. And then also just say, you know what? By the blood of Jesus, I'm forgiven. I can't undo what I've done or what I failed to do. Okay? Uh, I think if we all got honest, we could share some deficits that we've gone through, some dark, dark days. And I've gone through some dark days. And Rick uh, was a brother who was there in my time of need uh, when my uh, wife of 26 years left me. And, and I had to move from Arlington and, and, and I had this big house and had to move downsize. And Rick said to me, Jim, uh, when I asked for help, because uh, I was a little bit overwhelmed and, and biting my nails, and I just said, you know, Lord, I just got to start asking people for help. Rick told me, he says, Jim, I will come every day after work, and I'll come to your home, and I'll help you whatever needs to be done. Now, we didn't have five, six hours. We just had maybe an hour or two, but Rick was there. And uh, I'll never forget that, and it's a blessing. And so I, 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 don't, even, I don't call Rick, Rick Lessing. I call him Rick Blessing because he is a blessing to me. <laughs> Okay, and uh, so God, God uh, brings people in our lives that lift us up, doesn't he? And it doesn't have to let our past uh, dictate what our future has to be. It's in God's hands. That's, that's good news. So Paul, right there, that's, that's awesome. Um, okay, let's move on to, um, let's skip past 2 Timothy and go to Titus. I want to give you a couple passages there. And then we'll go to Second Timothy and wrap up. I like uh, Titus chapter two verse eleven, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. What does grace do? Verse twelve of chapter two. It teaches us. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. And we're still living in this present age. Christ hasn't returned yet, right? But while we're letting that grace of God teach us and transform us, verse 13, we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And who is he? He's the one who gave himself for us. Why? To redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own eager to do what is good. That's transformation, isn't it? Purity um, and eagerness to do what is good. And so he says, Titus, these then, these then are the things you should teach. Encourage and rebuke with all authority. Don't let anyone despise you. Stand up. And we all need that, don't we? We need the encouragement. That's the hug. And we need the rebuke. That's the kick in the pants, right? Sometimes we need the kick in the pants. And sometimes we need the hug. But those, those are, that's being authentic with each other. And a, a, a brother who will speak love to you, um, as Proverbs says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. In other words, they care enough, even though it may hurt you, to, 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 to share something with you that's good for you, that's important to you, in love, not just to, just to bring you down. Okay, And that's what Paul is saying to Titus. Encourage and rebuke. That's all a part of love. If God didn't love us, uh, he, he wouldn't send the, the gospel and the prophets of the Old Testament. He loved us. He, he sent that word, hey, people, wake up, right? We need that. And other times, he sent uh, the word to encourage us. And look at how that English word is put together. It's got two words. It's the word en, which comes from the uh, Greek in, courage. It's to bring courage in you. That's what you do when you encourage somebody, uh, that you, you actually... Uh, manifest uh, life and courage in their life to live for Christ. Okay? And then in closing, uh, on my section here, back to uh, 2 Timothy. Paul's last letter. 
<clears throat> I got to share, I, I'm going to share a personal story of another defeat. <laughs> okay. I didn't intend to do this, but I had a, I had a position. You guys, uh, George and Jan, get a, a, a crack out of this, and so did Ed and Susan, because they're, they're former, they're former Methodists like myself. But I had a, a Methodist job. It lasted about six months. <laughs> And uh, in, that, in that position, uh, they basically said, Jim, we think you should move on. Okay, that's fine. So uh, I wasn't a pastor, but I was uh, 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 helped with the youth and the Christian education. Well, they had a liturgy. And uh, the liturgy uh, is uh, a reading that you do. And every Sunday is already lined up from here, you know, January to December. You've got a reading of the Old Testament, you've got a reading of the Epistles, and then a reading of the Gospels. Well, the reading of the Gospels was 2 Timothy 4. And, uh, and I read the passage, and I went to the pastor, and I said, is this what I, and I was the reader of the liturgy. And I said, is this the passage I'm supposed to be reading today? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Well, I'm like, buddy, you didn't read this, did you? Uh, because I, I was, everybody knew I, this was my last Sunday, and, and that's my last time to be, get up there behind the pulpit and do this reading. And uh, I'm talking about 30 years ago. So it's been a long, yeah, 30, 30 years ago. <clears throat> you know you're old when you start counting decades, right? And it's like, okay. <laughs> and uh, each time I get, uh, get more decades. Um, okay, so, so Paul in, in chapter 4, we read those great words where he talks about him being poured out as a drink offering, right? And, and so that was, a, that was a passage I read on my last Sunday. I'm being poured out as a drink offering. <laughs> and uh, I fought the good fight and fought the, finished the race, and, and I've kept the faith. There you go. And uh, I really, you could hear a pin drop in the church. I was like. <laughs> and it was already printed in the bulletin. I mean, Jim just didn't pull this out. Say, like, here you go, people, you know, you chew on that. Uh, it was already there. And then it skipped down to uh, verse 16. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. <laughs> I was called into one of these meetings with all the parents, and they all had frowns. Uh, we got to let you go. <laughs> and they're all kind of sucking air at that point, at that service. May it not be held against them. But the Lord stood at my side. Uh, I was like, awesome. close my Bible. And, and at the end of that service, we, there was a pipe organ, and the lady was playing this grand hymn, and I put my shoulders up. <laughs> you know? That's kind of how I felt. I felt like, okay, Lord, I didn't do so well here. If somehow we didn't, we didn't click. And, uh, and yet, at the very end there, I felt God's blessing. Uh, okay, so that's my personal story. Uh, but for Paul, uh, he also, you know, felt God's blessing too, didn't he? Wouldn't that be great, for that, that to be our testimony at the end of our lives? That even though everyone deserted us, we felt the Lord was right there with us. I pray that that's our, that's our faith journey too. No matter when we get called home, whether suddenly or lingeringly, that we really sense the Lord is with us. And uh, of course, there's always these great stories you hear about people just before they die, they, they have a glimpse. And uh, I know Ravi Zacharias tells a story about his father-in-law. He just, he hadn't talked. He was kind of speechless and under medication. He opened his eyes and he said, it's amazing. And then he died. So, something. Uh, my own family story, uh, my great-grandmother, who uh, that was, I referenced earlier, my mom's grandmother, she was in a hospital. Uh, they didn't know it, but when they were on the way to, ho on the, way to the hospital that morning, she, had, she died. And when they left from the car to the, from the house to the car to get in to go to the hospital, someone heard singing. And they thought it was angels. Pretty cool. And uh, so, you know, you, you just never know what kind of greeting we're going to get. But when you love Jesus, no matter how our record has been or our batting average has been, God knows that we're just hanging in there sometimes. He loves us. And Christ came to forgive us. So... When you sin and you fall on your face, get back up because God knows all about it anyway. And he loves you. And you just repent and just turn to him, Lord, I blew it again. Help me to keep following you. And as someone has said, when you fall flat on your face, hey, you're falling forward, okay? And uh, uh, Jesus is there to pick you up. 
And in this case, these beautiful words, he's going to welcome you home with open arms. Uh, there's a beautiful artwork. I would have included it on my uh, slide if I would have thought ahead, but that one where Jesus greets somebody and they're embracing. Remember, have you seen that one? You can visualize that. Uh, that's a great scene too, isn't it? So praise God. So uh, like I said in, in this class, as we go over these books, we can't go really deep in a lot of them, but hopefully it kind of whets your appetite. Man, I want to know more about that. So, uh, you know, Rick has gone over several books. He's going to come up here in just a second and go over the last few for tonight. Uh, we're just speeding through, but hopefully it gets your interest that you can get some more study on your own. That's our prayer. So this is an overview. This is the survey. And we're hopefully that this kind of whets your appetite to learn more. Praise the Lord. Rick. Around the home stretch. How many of your parents in the room? Do uh, you have older parents, par uh, older kids, or younger kids? Older kids? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, you're no longer in diapers. Yeah, um, I I have been frustrated as, as a parent, uh, particularly as as, as uh, your, uh, kids get older and they get married and they uh, have their own kids, etc. There's this, there's this constant tension as a parent whether to say something or not say something. You know, because you want to tell them, uh, I wouldn't do that if I were you, uh, because uh, you know I've got the scars and the T-shirt. To you know, please don't do that, or. If you don't say something, you know, try, try to keep the peace, you know, uh, biting your tongue. Uh, but on that side, then they might think that, well, you really don't care. Uh, you're not putting any input in their lives. On the other end, if you say something, then you're too bossy. And, and they don't like the, you to be bossy and tell them what to do. So there's that constant tension as a parent. What do I do as, with a grown kid? You know, it's a, it's a constant tension. And so here we have Paul, with, uh, started with 1 Corinthians, and he's that parent. He wants to say something, but how does he say it? Uh, or does he say it? And then he ends up being pushy. So there's three different ways here to, to think about uh, the Corinthians, both 1st and 2nd Corinthians. Um, either A, Paul heard rumors, <laughs> information, got feedback from other Christians who were traveling through uh, Corinth, etc. It would be nice to forward that, Rick. I would love to do that. All right, here's Corinth. To give a little... It's part of Greece. Here we were talking about uh, Turkey and Ephesus, etc. Well, here's Corinth. Um, so either Paul is hearing um, what's happening at Corinth, some difficulties, some, some problems, some issues. So he draws up a hit list. You know, of, well, as a parent, here's what I, my, my suggestions. Here's my insight. 
here's what I think you ought to do about X, Y, Z. Or it's actually the Corinthians coming up with a list of questions uh, to Paul because they honor and respect him as the parent. Uh, so there's that, there's that uh, uh, speculation that, as Jim said, you have one, one side of the conversation phone call. You're hearing Paul's response to maybe some questions that are going out there, or the Paul's making the phone call and telling them, this is what I, what I would do, you know, because I'm hearing all these other uh, insight from everybody else. So that's what we have as far as 1 Corinthians, is we have a grown child who is messing up. They're doing all sorts of bizarre things. Uh, and even if they were coming up with some questions, they really don't want to hear the answers. So here we have Corinthians. And the irony is, um, I, I think it's a little ironic. Uh, Paul is, um, um, <laughs> there is there's an under, underflow of a theme throughout 1 Corinthians anyway, uh, that Paul's a little sarcastic. You ever, you ever felt as, as a parent that, you know, you just really, you want to be a little sarcastic. <laughs> you know, a little, little, little humor, but, you know, they're not really going to hear what I say, so I'm just going to be a little sarcastic and have a little fun in it a little bit. And so let me give you a little insight as to a little bit of sarcasm here with Paul. And it, it's hard hitting, but then he backs off and he has word plays constantly with the Corinthians. And they might not, sometimes they might be even clueless as to his personal humor. You know, that he's jibbing them. And it begins in 1 Corinthians, starting in uh, chapter, or, you know, ch chapter 1, verse 4. I always thank God for you because of his grace given to you in Christ Jesus. Common introduction. Here we go. For in him you have been enriched in every way, in all your speaking, in all your knowledge. He, he's, he's playing with their minds, their heads. He, he's, you are so smart. Man, you've got it covered. You are in. There's nobody that compares, no church that compares with you. And especially speaking with current concern your knowledge, because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. Therefore, you do not lack in any spiritual gift. You're not only smart, but man, you are endowed with spiritual gifts beyond anybody else. You got them racked up. I mean, you've got them all listed underneath your name. As you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, the Lord is faithful. Now, set that. that that's, that's his introduction. Man, I, I feel so built up and maybe a little ego. You know, hey, I'm I'm something special. He's, he's acknowledging. I might be a little rough around the edges, but, you know, I've, I've got things going here. Paul, Paul's stroking me here. Stroking my pride. I, I feel pretty big. Uh-huh. Come on. I'm pretty big here. Let's go on to chapter uh, 2 a little bit, verse 13. And this is where he gets into the word play. Chapter 2, verse 13. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. We have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who God. We speak from what God has That is what we speak, not in words taught to us by human wisdom. 
number one, puffing them up. Man, you are really wise. You are so smart. But here he sort of does one of those little numbers, sort of like a uh, Jethro Gibbs slap. I don't know if you watch SCIS, but anyway. Um, Jethro Gibbs slap. Uh, this is what we speak, not in words taught to us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, expressing, here's the word, spiritual truths, in spiritual words. So he throws in the word. First of all, he builds them up. He does a little gib slap with the, the sarcasm. Well, you're really spiritual, and you're really spiritually gifted, but you're stupid. When it comes, <laughs> when it comes to spiritual things, you're you're missing something. It, it's not in the DNA, you know. I'm I'm your dad, so it's not in the DNA. So you're you're missing a cog here somewhere. Verse chapter three. After you just got done encourage them, building them up, a little little gib slapped, you know, sort of wake them up a little bit. What would you do that for? Well, let's get to chapter three, brothers. I could not address you as spiritual, there's that word again, pneumatikos, but as worldly. Mere infants in Christ, I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. <laughs> oh, you are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, you are, are, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere men? Well, Paul, that, that's, that's insulting. I, I thought I was spiritual. I, that was, I had all, all, all things together. Well, uh, no, you, you don't. And so he goes through and has a list of check marks as to gauging them, as to helping them to take their spiritual pulse. We get to chapter 12, and he uses the same word. Because remember, chapter 1, they have all spiritual gifts. They have a, they have a corner market on spirituality, remember? But then a little gib slap, and then bringing, pressing them down, till well, you're just children, and I can't, really teach you anything because you, you, you want milk. You only want milk. You don't want anything else. You want pablum. You're, you're 30 years old, but you still got a bottle in your mouth. How many know some Christians like that? They have to be spoon-fed, and the diapers change, then they whine and they cry. They just don't know how to act. They make this terrible decision. I don't know what's happening. That's the Corinthian. And Paul, you guys got to get your act together. And the very area that they think that they excel in in spiritual gifts, and Paul stroked them in, then in chapter 12 he says, now about being spiritual. And he gives a context of, the Corinthians thought that they, were, they had the corner market on spirituality, that they could speak in tongues, that all these great experiences and, and visions, and it was all selfishness. It was all to exalt and build themselves up. And so Paul says, listen, after the gib slap and you're just children, you still got diapers on, now let me tell you what spirituality is. In the context of body life, it's not about all about you and what you can get out of things. The Holy Spirit and Jesus' ministry amongst you is, is not just for you and you alone. It's body ministry. It's encouraging and uplifting and building the body. So the other side of the, the, the conversation, in verse 14, he says it again. Follow the way of love and earnestly uh, a desire, pursue spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. And then he goes on and gets more specific. If you really want to be spiritual, in body life, that all that what you think is spiritual is, is pablum. It's milk. There's no substance to it. 
And then on top of it, chapter 15, which is another issue that the Corinthians had, had to do with, well, what about the resurrection? Because in Greek philosophy, we are, we are spirit creatures, spirit beings, held captive in a prison called the body, Plato. And they took a hook, line, and sinker. They thought, man, I can't wait to get rid of this body. Man, I'm imprisoned. I want to, fly, I want to fly free. I want to be free, free, and fly like a butterfly. And Paul says, no. Um, Jesus rose again in the dead with the same body that he died in. Is to experience the same thing. The same body that we have is going to be resurrected from the dead and have newness of life. Well, you say, well, where is that, Rick? Well, he uses the same word, spiritual, in the chapter 15, starting on 44. So it will be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown uh, is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. And it's kind of interesting in the, in the language in Greek is... There's only the one word stoma, body. And on each side you have spiritual and soulish for the same, describing the same noun. You don't have this separation that is in English. And so the idea is the transition is from an orientation, from a soulish body having to do with passions um, that our orientation is on this level and that same body because there's only one word soma is transitioned over, over to a different orientation and that's spiritual and we transfer, transfer from perishable to imperishable and he's telling the <laughs> the Corinthians who think that they're spiritual, man, you are missing it in theology. That's your blessed hope. You're missing it. You're missing it. The blessed hope is God sees us as a whole, you know, a whole being. That our physical death is an unnatural experience. That the separation from our body is an unnatural experience. That the blessed hope and the answer of the resurrection ultimately is that your body matters. Body, soul, and spirit. You will stand before Jesus in heaven, praising and singing the songs of Zion, body, soul, and spirit. And he puts that in context of the last days of the rest of chapter 15. So he's basically chiding or encouraging, the gib slap, dressing them down, teaching them what really spirituality is, and then this is the blessed hope. This is the end game. This is what really spirituality is. Not that we're spirit beings captivated and held, held in prison, but we're liberated right now, just like Ephesians. We have the benefits and the privileges, just as we're seated, seated in, the, in the seat in heaven or even right now. But for some reason, we're drugged down, we're dragged down, and we compromise what it means to be, have liberty in Christ. True freedom. And that freedom is in the power of the Holy Spirit. That we be the right people at the right time, at the right place. And that we can be the hands and feet of Jesus. That's body ministry. That's what the Corinthians were lacking. Second letter. Same song, second verse. They didn't get it the first time. <laughs> so Dad uh, Paul writes them again. It's interesting. 
that uh, Clement of Rome, some uh, 30 years later, about 95 A.D., writes to his brothers, writes from Rome uh, to his brothers and sisters at uh, Corinth, the same issues. He writes them as a, as a fellow brother uh, with this elder, elder team trying to send encouragement and correction to the Corinthians. Uh, the same issues. The same issues. After 30 years, another generation, things haven't changed. Go figure. Kids got to grow up. Thessalonians. Thessalonians. Let me time out. Let me see. Was there any blanks other than the titles? Nope. First and Second Corinthians. First Thessalonians. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Divisiveness. I'm sorry. Concerning the gifts of the Spirit, their divisiveness. I'm of Paul. <laughs> I'm of Apollos. You know, you know, a little divisiveness. My, the, per, the person on the cables preaches better than you do. So, uh, yeah, really encouragement. Thessalonians. Thessalonians is a church that has issues with Christ's return. They have heard or accepted the idea that Jesus already came and that uh, they missed it. Sort of the Left Behind series. And it became kind of disturbing as to, uh, what do we do now? We're left behind. I don't understand. Why, why did God leave me behind? Well, he didn't. Uh, so in Second Corinthians, I said Second Corinthians. Uh, no, it's First, First Thessalonians. In First Thessalonians, it has to do with sort of correcting him in the idea. Uh, and he says this, uh, chapter 4, verses 13 and on. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be ignorant. And that word ignorant is kind of harsh. Sort of a Gibbs, another Gibbs slap. You know, like, you know, just, just to wake you up a little bit, you know, you got some stinking thinking going on. Um, sort of a, let's reset your, your uh, spiritual up us a little bit, it's twirling around, um, about those who have fallen asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. That's one of the characteristics of a, a good, solid Christian. And we can grieve those who have gone before us, but the difference is that we have hope. They have gone to be with Jesus. They have, they have changed a dress, and that's it. They just changed a dress. Uh, believe that Jesus died and rose again bodily, by the way. We just talked about that in First Corinthians 15. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump, trump, trumpet, of God called, uh, trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we are still alive and are left, We'll be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we'll be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. So that's the Corinthians. Um, just uh, first and second Corinthians. Again, a second dose of similar ideas. Galatians. Be nice to flip through this, Greg. Pardon? Uh, second coming, I'm sorry. Uh, for example, the second coming of Christ. Thessalonica, 
far as a map. Here's Philippi as part of Greek, Greece. It's just down the, tra down the road, the same road from Philippi that goes along the coast, eventually goes through Greece to the other side. Uh, that's Thessalonica. So when he visited, excuse me, visited Philippi, he visited um, Thessalonica and Berea on the way down. We won't get into all this. Galatia is sort of a region in the middle of modern day Turkey. We won't talk about how the people migrated there, were brought in uh, to help fight some of the neighbors. The Romans loved to have them in the middle of everybody, so it kept everybody uh, on each other's, didn't trust anybody else. So they kept the Galatians in the middle to keep stirring up their things, to keep them disorganized and whatever. So the question is, was when was it that uh, Paul visited the Galatians? Uh, whether uh, early on uh, or much later. Uh, we can see here from the uh, second and, and third, uh, first, second, and third uh, missionary journeys that um, part of Galatia, at least what the Romans gave to them, is uh, Iconium and Derby and Lystra. So the possibility is, is later on. Uh, personally, I think it's right after the uh, first uh, missionary journey that Paul wrote this letter. So this, ideally, in my opinion, Galatians is the oldest of Paul's uh, writings. So it's written about 47 to 48, maybe before the Council of uh, Jerusalem. And if not before, soon thereafter. Why? Because the whole argument has to do with circumcision and what it means to be a Christian uh, not being circumcised. Uh, if if, and it's the argument with the Judaizers, um, if it were after uh, Jerusalem, all uh, the Council of Jerusalem, all Paul would have to do, we, we, we resolve this question and argument at the Council of Jerusalem. So bottom line is the uh, Galatians has to do about what it means to be a Christian, um, believing just like with Abraham, that we're justified by faith alone, not by works. Um, and that we can rest in Christ's accomplishments on the cross in that alone. Whereas Judaizers, uh, they wanted us to become as Gentiles outside of the former covenant with, uh, with the Jewish community. Um, uh, they wanted us to become Jews and then become Christians, fulfilled Christians. And so in your little... Um, uh, line there, the purpose written, the Galatians were infiltrated by false teachers or Judaizers uh, who muddled the simplicity of the gospel with religious legalism and human works, performance-oriented righteousness. And that's just uh, a brief <laughs> touching uh, of Galatians. Um, bottom line is... Um, close my Bible up. Anyway, um, that we are free in Christ uh, because of what Jesus did. So that's the evening. And we've gone over just a bit. Um, I pray that uh, tonight's been uh, not just uh, informative, but challenging. Um, if you have any further questions, uh, what was talked about tonight, uh, Jim and I will stay behind, linger behind,